Hello everyone, today we are going to study Hassofer Lind Reliability Index. By now you are familiar with uh, mean value first order second moment method and we have also defined Cornell's Reliability Index. We also solve a few problems. So, with that background, let us start our discussion on Hassofer Lind Reliability Index. In our last class, we studied mean value first order second moment method. Now, in this mathematical framework, we start with the definition of limit state function that is gx equal to 0. Now, this limit state can be either linear or non-linear and x represents a set of random variable which is defined by their probability density function. Now, from this definition, we can adopt algebra of variance to estimate the mean and standard deviation of g. And we assume that g is following normal distribution. So, then we end up with this pink line that represents the probability density function of g. Now, because this is normal, it is symmetric about the central point which is mu of g that is the mean value of g. And the dotted line, this black vertical line represents the limit state where g x equal to 0. So, it divides the entire space into two regions, failure and safe depending upon the value of g x whether it is less than 0 or greater than 0. Also, the distance between this 0 point and the mu g is beta times sigma g. So, once we use this relation mu g equal to beta times sigma g, we can estimate beta which is the ratio of mu g and sigma g. It is a non-dimensional number, we call it reliability index and because it was first proposed by Cornell, we call it Cornell's reliability index. Now, the limit state g x equal to 0 has the form c minus d equal to 0 where c represents capacity and d represents demand. So, long the capacity is more than demand, we are in a safe region. We also solve a few problems and then we identified what are the limitations of this mathematical derivation. The first one being the reference point in this entire exercise, we use mean value of x as our reference point. However, in reality, the design point may not be the mean value or it may be some other point and therefore, if we use mean as our reference point and estimate reliability index, we end up with an amount of error because of this approximation. The second one is the way we expand this limit state gx equal to 0 to estimate the first two moments and in that process, we expand this limit state using Taylor series which is an infinite series and therefore, we need to truncate that series and that we do after first two terms and neglect all higher order terms and in this linearization of the limit state because we truncate and only consider first two terms, this linearization also introduces a significant amount of error. Then we also notice that if we change the format of the limit state as you can see on your screen, so the first one is c minus d equal to 0 and the second one is 1 minus d by c equal to 0. So, the problem statement remains same the level of uncertainty remains same, only the format of the limit state changes and then if we use different formats of the limit state and find out Cornell's reliability index, we end up with different estimates of beta and subsequently probability of failure which is phi of minus beta. This is what we call lack of invariance. All these drawbacks actually motivated us to look into more accurate models of reliability analysis. And that is the reason uh, we are going to 
find out how we can address all these issues and more accurately estimate the reliability index. For that, let us start again from the definition proposed by Cornell. So, we have gx equal to 0. So, it is c minus d equal to 0. And without loss of generality, we can assume c and d to be normal for the time being. And because both of them are normal, they are represented by two parameters, mean and sigma. So, the subscript c and d represents capacity and demand. Now, graphically, you can see the blue line represents the limit state that divides C D plane into two regions, one is failure, another is safe. Now, let us introduce a transformation and we have two new random variables Z1 and Z2, where Z1 equal to C minus mu C divided by sigma C and Z2 equal to D minus mu D by sigma D. So, effectively what we do? We subtract mean and then divide it by the standard deviation. And in that process, we end up with a new random variable z, which is having zero mean and unit standard deviation. Now, if we introduce this transformation, then we get this new representation in the z1, z2 plane where again the blue line represents the limit state, but this time it does not pass through the origin, but it shifts with some intercepts over the two orthogonal axes Z1 and Z2. Now we can represent C and D using Z1 and Z2 and that if we put back in the original expression of limit state C minus D equal to 0, we get the equation of this straight line in the standard normal space, which you can see on your screen it is z1 times sigma c minus z2 times sigma d plus mu c minus mu d equal to 0. So, these new random variables are in standard normal space and the limit state function is linear. So, we have the new expression of the limit state in the standard normal space and then if we look for the point where we are going to design, obviously all points on the limit states satisfy limit state function, but they cannot be the design point and intuitively we can conclude that the point which is nearest to the origin will be the point of first failure and therefore, we can use that point as our design point. So, in this graphical representation, the point Q, where we draw a perpendicular OQ over this line PR represents the optimal point. So, we use intercepts P and R over the Z1 and Z2 axis and then we can apply trigonometry or coordinate geometry to find out this normal distance, which if you solve, you will get OQ as mu c minus mu d divided by sigma c square plus sigma d square whole to the power half. Now, from our discussion on variance algebra, we have seen that mu c minus mu d is nothing but mu of g and the term in the denominator is sigma g. So, OQ for this linear limit state in the standard normal space is again the ratio of mu g by sigma g which is equal to beta. You can solve this problem for that you first find out OP and OR that you can easily find out by putting z1 equal to 0 first and then z2 equal to 0 second and then find out these two intercepts and then apply trigonometry to find out OQ or alternatively, we know the equation of this straight line. So, the perpendicular distance from the origin also we can find out and we can estimate this OQ. So, what we get is the definition of 
reliability index which is the shortest distance of this linear limit state or performance function whichever way we call it in the standard normal space. Now this definition was first proposed by Hassofer and Lind and therefore we call it Hassofer Lind reliability index. So effectively we start from gx equal to 0 which is c minus d equal to 0 and that we convert into standard normal space. So we find out the expression of limit state in the standard normal space and then find out the optimal distance. Now the question that comes in our mind that what happens when the limit state is not a linear function but a non-linear function. So if we look at the graphical representation, this pink line which is a curved line represents the non-linear limit state gz equal to 0 and the blue line is the linear limit state function and both of them are having one common point q where this blue line is tangential to the pink line and this q point represents the closest point to the origin and therefore this is the minimum point which lies over both blue line as well as pink line. So our job is to find out z star any point on the limit state among all these possibilities the one that is the closest to the origin in the standard normal space will give us the design point. So effectively we find out this optimal distance from the origin for both linear or non-linear limit state. If the limit state is linear then both Cornell's definition and hassofer lins definition both of them are same and we can easily find out the estimate of beta. However, in case of non-linear limit state function we have to solve for it but the definition of the limit state giving us a reliability index goes like this. It is the optimal distance of the limit state from the origin in the standard normal space whether the limit state function is linear or non-linear. So the question is how to find out this uh, failure point on the limit state function. Now for that again we find out this optimal point which is the most probable point of failure or in short form we call it MPP. So our objective function is dn which is norm of z that is the distance of any point on this pink line provided it satisfies that condition g of z star equal to 0. So this is an optimization problem and we can employ any technique for optimization. However, in this discussion we are going to solve the problem using Lagrange multiplier technique. So before we solve the reliability problem, let us quickly go through the Lagrange multiplier technique particularly for those to whom this technique is new. So the, it was first introduced by Italian mathematician Joseph Lagrange and the problem statement goes like this. We have a function fx that we are going to optimize subjected to an equality constraint gx equal to 0. If that is the problem statement, we minimize the function. We can also maximize but we minimize simply because in the reliability problem we find out minimum distance. So we minimize this function subjected to a constraint gx equal to 0. Then we first define Lagrangian function which is L of unknowns in this case x and lambda. It is as per definition fx the original function that is the objective function plus lambda which is a scalar multiplier times g of x. Once we define the Lagrangian then we differentiate with respect to unknowns in this case x and lambda and then equate them to 0 to find out the optimal solution. Now we effectively convert this constraint optimization into a unconstrained optimization where we optimize this Lagrangian function and the moment we differentiate with respect to lambda that is the Lagrange multiplier it automatically satisfies the constraint condition. 
Now in this case we have only one constraint condition. So we have one Lagrange multiplier. If we have n additional constraint conditions to satisfy, then we introduce n Lagrange multiplier lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3 up to lambda n and then also we differentiate L with respect to all those Lagrangian uh, multiplier to develop additional equations that automatically satisfies the constraint condition. So let us solve a problem. We have a function f of xy which is x plus y that we are going to optimize but intuitively you can conclude that as x and y ranges from minus infinity to plus infinity, the maxima or minima of this function f of xy will be at plus minus infinity. However, the situation changes the moment we introduce a constraint condition in this case g of xy which is x square plus y square minus 1 equal to 0. So if that is the problem statement, again we first define Lagrangian which is f of xy plus lambda times g of xy and then if we use the expression of individual functions, we end up with this expression where the unknowns are x, y and lambda and therefore to optimize we first find out gradient that means we differentiate L with respect to unknowns x, y and lambda. And for the optimal solution, we equate this first derivative to 0 to find out where we have maxima or minima. Now if we see the graphical representation, you can see the plane that represents x plus y and x and y goes to plus minus infinity, so does the function f of x and y. But the moment we introduce constraint condition, between x and y which is the equation of a circle, you can see the circle on the xy plane which is x square plus y square minus 1 equal to 0, we can find out the maxima or minima. Effectively what we do, we project this circle onto this plane and we end up with this elliptical profile. From there we can identify what are the maxima and minima. So let us complete the solution. So we find out first the gradients and then equate them to 0 and thereby we end up with these three equations. And the last equation when we differentiate L with respect to lambda automatically satisfies the constraint condition. So to solve these expressions, first we use equation 1 and equation 2 and with the help of these two equations, we represent x and y in terms of lambda. Then, once we represent x and y in terms of lambda, we put them back into the third equation that satisfies the constraint conditions and we can solve this expression to find out lambda which is in this case plus minus 1 by square root of 2. And you can see on your screen the maxima and minima point and the corresponding values of maxima and minima and in this problem we also have two stationary points that also we can estimate from this optimal solution of lambda. So with that uh, let us go back to our reliability problem. Recall we started with gx equal to 0 and then we introduce a transformation to convert this gx equal to 0 into gz equal to 0 and then our objective function is dn and we have a constraint to satisfy that is g of z star equal to 0. So we first define Lagrangian in a similar way we did earlier because we have only one constraint condition, we have only one Lagrange multiplier. And this z represents the number of random variables we have in our problem. So there can be n number of random variables. So we have n plus 1 unknowns 
n coming from this vector random variable z and one additional equation because of this Lagrange multiplier lambda. So, we differentiate L with respect to all these unknowns. The first one where we differentiate L with respect to zi, i ranges from 1, 2, 3 up to n. So, that gives us the optimal solution of z and then we have one additional condition that is when we differentiate L with respect to lambda and equate to 0, we get the constraint condition. So, let us find out the optimal solution. So, we have these two equations to solve and the first equation actually gives us n equations as we keep on changing the values of i from 1 to n. So, we use matrix notation to solve these n equations. So, our expression is on the screen. So, if we take this lambda g on the right hand side and then we can easily estimate the lambda which is nothing but norm of capital G star whole to the power minus 1 where this capital G represents the gradient vector that we get by differentiating g with respect to z. So, the optimal solution for this z we can easily identify is we take this lambda times g on the right hand side. So, we have minus lambda g star. Then this norm of z is nothing but the objective function dn. So, we have the optimal solution z star which is equal to minus lambda dn capital G star. Now, this equation still we cannot solve because we are yet to know this dn which is the optimal solution. Now, for that, uh, we pre-multiply both sides by capital G transpose and substitute lambda. Then, we end up with the optimal distance dn, which is nothing but beta is equal to minus capital G star times capital Z star times capital G star transpose divided by norm of capital G star. So, effectively, we have solved this uh, optimal distance in the standard normal space which is our most probable point of failure. So, this z star now we can represent using a new form alpha i star times beta where alpha i star is nothing but the direction cosines and the expression for this direction cosines are like this minus of first differential of g with respect to z divided by norm of capital G star. So, if you look at this optimal solution for Z star for which we need to know two informations direction cosines and beta. But again beta is the optimal distance. So, looking at this expression we can easily conclude that we cannot solve this expression directly but we can iteratively solve this expression where we start with an initial guess and then iteratively solve the new uh, z star and thereby we update the estimate of beta. So, the solution goes like this. We start with a limit state function g x and then we convert that to g z. Once we know g z, we first find out the derivative of the transformed limit state with respect to z that is the standard normal variable. Then in the next step we assume initial values of beta which preferably in the range of 3 to 5. This I will discuss when we will solve some problem. We also start with initial values of direction cosines. However, we have to keep in mind that direction cosines have a property summation of alpha i square should be equal to 1. And then once we do that, then we express the limit state in terms of unknown beta and alpha i. And then finally, we solve this expression to find out the new estimate of beta. And then once we solve that, we can update the gradient vector 
once we update the gradient vector we can find out the new direction cosines and then if the difference between the new estimate of beta and the initial value of beta is well within the tolerance limit then we can stop the iteration otherwise we change these initial values with the new estimate of beta and alpha i and repeat this iterative procedure until and unless the convergence is achieved. Now this algorithm was first proposed by Rackwitz, so we call it Rackwitz algorithm to solve for Hasselhoff Lind reliability index. Now once we find out the optimal point in the z space, we can again transform it back to the original space because we have to design in the original space. And in this process, because we use up to first order term, we call it first order reliability method. There is an alternate proof for this, uh, which is very simple. So if we use gz function and expand it in Taylor series, then we can find out mu g and sigma g. And in terms of matrix notation, we get this expression that you can see on your screen then once we have it we can find out beta which is the ratio of mu g and sigma g and we end up with the same expression. So this is an alternate proof you can also verify yourself. So let us solve some problem. So in this case we have a cantilever beam and this cantilever beam of length L equal to 2 meter so length is deterministic and it is exposed to a point load at the free end and we are going to design this problem against plastic capacity. Obviously at the support we will have maximum applied bending moment and therefore we design at this location where the capacity is defined by this Fy times Z where Fy is the yield strength and Z is the section modulus. So that is the capacity minus the applied moment that is the demand P times L. Symbolically we can represent this Gx into this new form x1 times x2 minus x3 times L equal to 0. Now all these random variables x1, x2, x3 are uncorrelated normal and their properties are given because they are normal mean and standard deviation completely defines the problem so you can see mean values and standard deviation of x1, x2, x3 are given. Now once we have this problem statement, let us solve for the reliability index and then probability of failure. So we start with gx equal to 0 and we convert them into gz equal to 0 and for that we use a transformation. So we have say x1 equal to mu1 plus z1 times sigma1. Similarly, we also express x2 and x3 in terms of z2 and z3. So we have this gz which is originally in the x space x1 times x2 minus x3 times l equal to 0. So we put the expression of x1, x2, x3 and we end up with this expression and that if we simplify, we have the expression of gz in the standard normal space. So if you recall the optimal solution z star is nothing but alpha i star times beta right. So we are going to solve this z star. So in this expression of gz we know mean and standard deviation of all the random variables. So we can uh, substitute all known parameters and then for z1, z2, z3 we can substitute this expression alpha i times beta and then we end up with the final expression of gz in terms of alpha and beta. So this is a quadratic equation of beta that we are going to solve. And recall the property of uh, direction cosine says summation of alpha i square must be equal to 1. So using Rackwitz algorithm let us solve this problem. So we first differentiate 
gz with respect to z1 z2 and z3 then we start the iterative solution we first assume initial values of alpha i because we have three random variables so we have three direction cosines and we apply equal weightage to all of them and end up with this expression so that summation of alpha i square equal to 1 so that gives us the initial guess for alpha i which is 0 0.5774 and then we also start our iterations with beta initial as 3 the reason why we consider beta equal to 3 for these type of problems we expect our beta in that range and therefore if we start with a good guess obviously we can expect less number of iterations otherwise uh, the iterative solution will continue for long before we achieve convergence. Now once we have our initial guess on alpha i and beta using these two information we can find out our initial design point and because we have equal weightage along alpha i so we have the same estimate for z i n. Then using these values we can estimate the direction cosines that we have already obtained the three expressions on the left hand side of your screen. So if we put them back we get the gradients estimated at this initial design point and then we find out our alpha i. Now look at the sign for this alpha i that we use as our best guess and in that process we change the sign because uh, that leads to a faster convergence. So we develop the limit state equation using these values and unknown beta. So our equation ends up with this expression. 0.38 beta square minus 44.73 beta plus 100 equal to 0. So this is a quadratic equation of beta and we can solve for the roots and then if we do that we end up with these two expressions. Out of that the first possibility we will use because that is the point for first failure. So our beta final is 2.2689. Then to continue the iteration we change our initial values of alpha as the last estimate of alpha and then beta initial with this new estimate of beta and then repeat the iterative procedure until the tolerance level is achieved. Here I just wish to draw your attention that this uh, expression of beta you can see on your screen this is an algebraic expression but not always we, we can have algebraic expression so that we can find out roots. So if we have any other equations we can still find out when it will come I will update you. So if we complete the iterative solution so first we start with initial beta value of 3 and I have already explained that the new estimate is 2.2689 and then using that values we can estimate alpha and then initial design point and continue the iterative procedure. So in the third iteration we get 2.2577 and for that uh, we verify the stopping criteria where the difference between the two beters in two successive iterations if it is less than the tolerance then we stop the iteration. So in this case after third iteration we stop the iteration because we achieve convergence and the design point or most probable point of failure is z star that is minus 1.4939 minus 0 0.6587 and 1.5593. So these we can use to find out 
the reliability index which is the norm of this vector and then uh, that is 2.2576. So, after third iteration we can estimate pf which is phi of minus beta. So, in this case probability of failure is 1.1984 into 10 to the power minus 2. So, for this design problem we have estimated the probability of failure using hassofer lind reliability index. So, in summary, we optimize this dn which is the distance of any point z subjected to a constraint condition that it must satisfy the limit state function that means it must lie on this limit state function represented by this pink line. So, once we have the problem statement we first cast the Lagrangian function and then differentiate Lagrangian with respect to unknowns in this case unknowns as zi and lambda i ranges from 1 to n. So, the first set of equations represents the first derivative of L with respect to the standard normal variables and the last equation when we differentiate L with respect to lambda we get the constraint condition that we must satisfy. Then the first set of equation in the matrix form gives us this expression from where we estimate lambda and in this expression capital G represents the gradient vector and once we find out lambda we can find out the optimal solution z star and in this expression we have on the right hand side dn which is the objective function. Then after matrix operation we can show that the optimal distance dn which is equal to the reliability index we have this expression and finally, we have also z star optimal solution in terms of alpha i that is the direction cosine times beta where alpha i is represented by this expression provided that it must satisfy that condition summation of alpha i square equal to 1. So, this algorithm was proposed by Rackwitz and that is how we solve Hassofer leaned reliability index. Now, there may be different possibilities based on the type of random variables that we encounter when we cast our random variables and the limit state function gx equal to 0. So, we have already solved for problems where uh, random variables are normal and uncorrelated. So, the first set of first type of problem is when the random variables are uncorrelated normal then it can be uncorrelated but the random variables can be non-normal then it can be correlated but normal and then finally the most general case where it can be correlated and non-normal so all these possibilities we have to consider one by one out of that first one we have solved today and as we progress in this course you will see we are going to solve all these problems where different types of random variables we encounter when we define our limit state. So, with that we come to the closure of this lecture. Uh, we have developed the model for Hassofer lean reliability index and we have solved uh, one example. In our next class we will continue uh, our discussion on the same topic and we will also explore some other uh, problems that we encounter in uh, reliability based design. Thank you very much.